Very good. So thanks everybody for coming today. Um, and it gives me great pleasure to start off today's session. Um, we'd like to, the, our first keynote uh, speaker for this morning is Professor Aru Chinayan. It's a great honor for me to introduce him. He is a professor of pathology at the University of Michigan and director for the Center of Translational Pathology. He's also a member of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and also a American Cancer Society research professor. Um, I followed Arul's career <laughs> from a distance for many, many years and I think he really embodies the true clinician scientist uh, being able to take the most cutting edge technologies and really to apply them to uncover biological findings, medical findings of great clinical significance. Um, the, his uh, 2008 paper, Science on the Discovery of the Tempest II er, Fusion Gene, is a classic in the field. It's a paper that I use when I teach my medical students um, what true translational cancer research is all about. So, and he's still continuing to push the field, moving next generation sequencing into the clinic. And I think that you will, all of the students here will find his talk really inspirational. So without further ado, can I please call Arul to the stage? Okay. Uh, thank you, Patrick, for the uh, kind uh, introduction. Uh, and I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers um, Paul and uh, others for the invitation uh, here. This is actually my first time to uh, mainland China, and I've been stunned by the um, uh, amazing amount of progress that I've witnessed and uh, the amount of uh, building in terms of structures, but also in terms of scientific programs that I've uh, at least witnessed uh, at some uh, universities that I've visited in uh, Shanghai. So it's been quite uh, eye-opening uh, for me. Um, so what I plan to talk about today uh, is a sort of a nice follow-up, I would say, uh, to what um, Charlie presented uh, yesterday. I think Charlie really focused uh, on some of the challenges uh, as well as uh, pitfalls uh, associated with precision medicine or precision oncology approaches. Uh, I, what I'll present um, is uh, more on the, uh, potential, the potential promise of precision medicine and precision oncology uh, moving, moving forward. So I think uh, various aspects of this need to be considered as we move these uh, efforts uh, forward. And certainly, um, uh, it has attracted a lot of attention uh, in terms of um, uh, various countries beginning to invest heavily in these areas. You've certainly heard of um, uh, President Obac Barack Obama's uh, uh, initiative in the US to begin to fund and support uh, precision medicine efforts. Uh, from my colleagues in Shanghai, hi, I've heard rumors that even the Chinese government is considering a similar uh, effort in precision medicine, uh, potentially at a scale much greater than even uh, the U.S. in terms of the number of participants involved. So this is certainly an area of uh, tremendous uh, interest as we move forward in terms of medicine, really taking advantage uh, of understanding uh, the molecular landscape of human disease and uh, using that information in a rational fashion to uh, treat uh, disease. Um, so my laboratory and center at the University of Michigan uh, focuses on uh, diverse areas of interest, uh, some of which are listed on this uh, slide. Uh, but what I'll be focusing on today are these two topics. Um, one is on the role of long non-coding RNAs in cancer. I, I noticed that there were certainly a number of uh, posters as well as talks really focused around non-coding RNAs, so I thought I would highlight a bit of uh, our work in that area. This is probably an area that is maybe in its infancy in terms of its relevance to precision oncology and precision medicine, but I think is really going to be the, the future uh, as we uh, move forward, at least in biomarker development, as well as even in uh, therapeutic uh, targeting, and probably is relevant to the precision cancer biology component uh, of this meeting. The second, uh, 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 the rest of my presentation 
will really be focused on uh, establishing clinical sequencing for use in precision oncology and sort of how we began our efforts in that area and how we've been sort of advancing that moving forward. Um, so just a little bit about long uh, non-coding RNAs. Um, certainly uh, over 98% of the human genome uh, is not expressed in, or, or not, uh, does not encode protein coding genes. So one of the major questions in, in the field moving forward is what is happening in terms of the non-coding component uh, of the genome. Um, what are long non-coding RNAs, link RNAs? Uh, they're transcribed by RNA pol 2 They generally have a transcript length of greater than 200 nucleotides. Uh, they can have multiple exons and un undergo alternative splicings. Uh, they can also be polyadenylated. They classically have an epigenetic signature of H3K4 trimethylation at promoters, as well as H3K36 trimethylations across the gene body. Uh, so they, look, they can often look quite similar to protein coding genes. Um, what's interesting about uh, long non-coding RNAs is that subsets of them are uh, oftentimes exquisitely lineage-specific, and what we find is, is that some of these um, link RNAs are even disease-specific. Um, long non-coding RNAs, uh, unlike, for example, microRNAs, which you've probably heard more about, um, are uh, the functional uh, relevance of these link RNAs are much more mysterious, I would say. Uh, certainly a lot has been worked out in terms of the biology of how um, microRNAs work, uh, but long non-coding RNAs have diverse mechanisms potentially of, of function, some of which I've listed here. Uh, for example, uh, uh, physically interacting with epigenetic complexes, um, uh, enhancer RNAs, tumor suppressor signaling, uh, RNA processing, RNA-RNA interactions, uh, as well as in potentially um, microRNA sequestration, essentially functioning like sponges. Uh, they've been linked to normal biology as well as disease biology. Uh, for example, the EXIST long non-coding RNA has been implicated in X chromosome inactivation. Uh, other long non-coding RNAs have been linked to stem cell maintenance, uh, differentiation, and uh, specification into various tissue lineages. Uh, they've even been linked to various human diseases, including Alzheimer's disease, and what I'll be talking about primarily is cancer. Uh, so the long non-coding RNA that's probably received the most notori notoriety in terms of cancer has been the link RNA called hot air, uh, which is characterized by um, Howard Chang and uh, John Rin. Uh, this link RNA was um, identified as a link RNA that interacts with the PRC2 epigenetic complex as well as other epigenetic complexes. Uh, hot air has been shown to be associated with poor prognosis, so high levels of hot air uh, in breast cancer are associated again with a more aggressive disease relative to low levels of hot air. Uh, and our work really uh, stimulated by those early findings in terms of long non-coding RNAs uh, in, in breast cancer was to try to begin to explore these long non-coding RNAs in other cancers, potentially in prostate cancer, uh, as well as uh, other uh, epithelial tumors, taking advantage of next-generation sequencing-based technologies. Uh, before our, our work, um, long non-coding RNAs were primarily explored using microarray-based technologies. We basically employed uh, next-generation uh, transcriptome sequencing to try to explore and discover novel long non-coding RNAs across different tissue lineages, uh, as well as in uh, cancer-specific long non-coding RNAs. We were using these uh, uh, next-generation uh, transcriptome sequencing-based approaches, approaches to really discover gene fusions in common solid tumors, uh, and we were generating uh, hundreds to thousands of, of samples uh, in terms of transcriptomic uh, data. And so one of our questions was, can we take advantage uh, of this transcriptomic data to basically nominate and identify long non-coding RNAs in the context of cancer. So we basically developed a set of computational tools to nominate a long non-coding RNA from transcriptomic data. So we basically developed ab initio approaches to basically assemble uh, the reads that were intergenic in nature to basically call the structure of these long non-coding RNAs. And our first foray into this was, it was in, in, in prostate cancer using some of the early generation uh, Illumina technology. Uh, we basically profiled prostate cancer progression from benign to clinically localized disease to metastatic disease. We certainly picked up many of the protein coding genes, 70% in this case, but we identified probably on the order of about 20% of these uh, uh, long non-coding RNAs as unannotated uh, transcripts. 
and we named them, and here are, is a heat map representation, red meaning elevated, blue meaning downregulated, uh, and we call this first set of long non-coding RNAs in prostate cancer PCAT for pre, pre, uh, prostate cancer associated transcripts from PCAT1 to PCAT114, some of which are listed in this particular heat map representation. Our next question was, can we begin to use the latest version uh, of these uh, sequencing-based technologies as well as uh, adapted pipelines to basically explore not only our data, we had, a, we had assembled about 1,000 transcriptomic data sets. We took advantage at the time when we began this project about two years ago uh, or about a year and a half ago, we assembled what was available in the TCGA effort. Uh, which was about 6,000 transcriptomic libraries, and basically employed uh, a variety of bioinformatics approaches basically to analyze this, this data. So this is a pie chart representing the compendium of data that we assembled in terms of transcriptomic data to, to analyze. As you can see, this is a variety of different cancers that are represented here. Um, and we were able to nominate uh, actually over 50,000 novel long non-coding RNAs from this uh, analysis. So we basically deployed uh, meta-assembly approaches to assemble the transcriptome uh, of about 7,000 samples that we had assembled uh, at, at the time. So through this effort, uh, we uh, identified uh, over 8,000 cancer-related long non-coding RNAs, uh, as well as a host of long non-coding RNAs that basically defined various tissue types or lineages. Well, one of the remarkable observations that we had were that these long non-coding RNAs could be exquisitely tissue or lineage specific, as well as in some cases cancer or disease specific. So here's basically a heat map representation across different uh, cancer types that are represented here, for example, breast, prostate, uh, liver, and, and so forth, and a set, sets of long non-coding RNAs that basically define these different uh, uh, lineages of, of tissues. When we had matched normal samples, we were then able to actually identify not only long non-coding RNAs that were lineage specific, but also long non-coding RNAs that defined uh, cancer, that were also cancer specific, and these are listed, uh, listed here as being elevated. Um, so in the published paper, you can actually uh, call out and see the various long non-coding RNAs that we've defined across different tissue types. Uh, for example, in lung adenocarcinoma, we call these LA cats for uh, associated transcripts. So in some cases, hundreds to thousands of novel long non-coding RNAs that, that were defined through this analysis. So there's potentially certainly uh, a tremendous wealth of information in terms of biomarker development, as well as potentially understanding cancer biology. We certainly believe that at least a subset of these long non-coding RNAs are important in uh, differentiation, in normal differentiation, as well as a subset are likely involved in cancer progression. So we've developed a resource to take advantage of this transcriptomic data. This is actually an evolution uh, of the Oncomine database that we developed for microarray and genomic data in general. We call this My Transcriptome. This is basically an assembly uh, of uh, uh, next generation sequencing transcriptomic data, RNA-seq data. This website is freely available. Uh, to the public, and you can basically explore this uh, data set. Right now, it's really geared towards uh, expressed long non-coding RNAs, and it's focused on about 8,000 or so long non-coding RNAs that are represented in our first study. Um, next generation versions of this uh, database will start to include protein coding genes, as well as additional uh, long non-coding uh, RNAs, as well as begin to represent uh, the entire TCGA uh, data set, as well as other data that we've uh, assembled uh, from the public domain. So this is a view uh, of the database itself. Uh, for example, uh, in hot air, you can basically pull up hot air and see that in breast cancer, uh, a subset of breast cancers have very high levels of hot air. But you can see that hot air is actually expressed in, in, in subsets of other uh, epithelial tumors. In this example, we basically interrogated the database for uh, SHLAP1. Uh, which is a long non-coding RNA that we've been focused on in terms of cancer biology, in terms of prostate cancer biology. Uh, and you can see that this long non-coding RNA is exquisitely specific for prostate cancer relative to other cancers. And we ended up following this particular long non-coding RNA in, in, in much more detail. This is just another view of the data, again showing exquisite specificity to a subset of prostate cancers uh, relative to other uh, tissue types. Uh, through a collaboration with a company called GenomeDx, 
we were able to take advantage of their exon array data to actually show that SHLAP1 as a long non-coding RNA was the top prognostic gene in this uh, data set looking at all protein coding genes uh, as well as all long non-coding genes. So we believe that this is a key uh, long non-coding RNA that will be useful in predicting uh, aggressiveness in, in, in prostate cancer. Um, and this is just a representation of one of the data sets where we basically show that high levels of, long no, uh, of the long non-coding RNA SHLAP1 is associated with poor prognosis relative to low levels uh, of this long non-coding RNA. And this has now been shown in about five independent data sets uh, by at least two independent groups uh, exploring uh, SHLAP1 uh, in this context. Um, one of the uh, aspects of prostate cancer, of course, is can we basically detect this long non-coding RNA in a non-invasive fashion? So this is just uh, early data to show that we can actually detect this long non-coding RNA SHLAP in the urine of men with prostate cancer. Again, this is a subset of patients where we can detect uh, SHLAP1 is being elevated. These patients tend to have more aggressive forms of prostate cancer, higher Gleason grade, as well, uh, as, well as higher risk versions of prostate cancer. And we actually plan to uh, uh, add this long non-coding RNA to existing RNAs that we've been able to monitor in, in urine. For example, the tmprss 2 erg gene fusion, which we couple with the long non-coding RNA PCA3. This is actually already available clinically uh, to detect um, forms of prostate cancer, aggressive forms of prostate cancer. We plan to basically add SHLAP1 into, uh, this, uh, into this mix to basically create a multiplex biomarker uh, of prostate cancer uh, aggressiveness. This is just a, an ROC curve looking at TNPRSS2 ERG combined with the long non-coding RNA PCA3 uh, relative to uh, serum PSA uh, alone, when, which you get a general, generally an area under the curve of about 0.6. Uh, when you can begin to combine biomarkers, you can achieve area under the curves approaching 0.8. Um, so what's interesting about SHLAP, although we've been studying hundreds to a th thousands of long non-coding RNAs in prostate cancer, uh, only a very small set of these link RNAs appear to be associated with uh, biological progression or actually potentially have a role in, in human disease. And SHLAP1, we believe, appears to be uh, one of those link RNAs. I won't be able to go into the details about its biological function. Much of this is published, although some of this data is still, still unpublished. Um, this long non-coding RNA we've shown physically interacts with the SWISNF epigenetic complex. We believe that this is how its mechanism of action works. It's actually, we believe, an oncogenic long non-coding RNA, again, elevated specifically in prostate cancer. It interacts with the SWISNF uh, complex, which is an epigenetic complex involved in nucleosomal remodeling. It's been implicated as a tumor suppressor. Uh, SWISNF has been shown, the SWISNF complex has been shown to negatively regulate the PRC2 complex as an oncogenic epigenetic complex. So we believe that SHLAP, SHLAP1 uh, negatively regulates this tumor suppressor complex, which then can negatively regulate PRC2. And we believe that this is how its mechanism of action may, uh, may be presumed, similar in, in some ways to uh, hot air and other link RNAs interacting with PRC2 and uh, mediating its, uh, its function. In this case, this long non-coding RNA actually physically interacts with this epigenetic complex and negatively regu regulates its function. Uh, so what are we going to do next in terms of the long non-coding RNA space? Uh, we, will, we continue to analyze public domain RNA-seq data, including TCGA. Uh, we plan to add, again, functionality to the My Transcriptome resource, so it'll be uh, more useful to the academic community. Uh, we're beginning to characterize candidate link RNAs as tissue biomarkers as well as non-invasive cancer biomarkers, primarily really leveraging the lineage specificity of these long non-coding RNAs. Um, per, we're pursuing the biological function, of, again, of a small subset uh, of the most interesting cancer-related link RNAs, including SHLAP, as well as a series of other link RNAs across different tissue types. Uh, we're also exploring the idea, uh, especially when we identify a link RNA that appears to be associated with cancer biology and cancer progression, uh, the, the idea of therapeutically targeting these long non-coding RNAs uh, using uh, antisense oligo technology. 
One of the mysteries that we're certainly interested in pursuing is why are these long non-coding RNAs indeed expressed in a lineage-specific fashion, and why are these long non-coding RNAs expressed uh, oftentimes in a cancer-specific or disease-specific function? What are the global mechanisms of regulation uh, of these long non-coding RNAs? So this is a team uh, that was really associated with our long non-coding RNA work, and those highlighted in red were uh, quite significant uh, collaborators. And uh, now I will uh, transition um, uh, my talk to something that's a bit more uh, mature, I would say, in terms of clinical application and translation. Uh, you heard a lot uh, of introduction about this area, uh, both from Paul and Ch Charlie uh, yesterday. And, uh, and we began our effort in about 2010, 2011, and basically established uh, this study uh, that was in transla science translational medicine with the idea that cancer patients, that we should begin to comprehensively define the mutational landscape of individual cancer patients in real time uh, by, by, uh, uh, by procuring biopsies uh, and be able to then return those, that information to individual patients to guide uh, treatment selection. And this is what, what was suggested in this particular study. And uh, as you heard uh, from Charlie yesterday, there are a number of challenges and pitfalls that we need to, uh, that we need to consider as we move forward with these efforts. But what I'll be primarily focusing on in this particular study is really uh, what Charlie uh, characterized as truncal driver mutations in, in terms of the types of uh, mutations that we've really focused on in terms of suggesting potential therapies. Sort of truncal mutations that are high allele fraction, uh, major, uh, major, major clonal uh, 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 clonal uh, versions uh, of these mutations. Uh, so why do we want to take on a comprehensive approach uh, to understand the molecular landscape of cancer? Uh, generally, tumors have a private combination uh, of mutations. Oftentimes, there are rare driver mutations, sort of this long tail uh, of mutations uh, that uh, can be identified. For example, RAF fusions or AKT mutations in prostate cancer. Uh, ALK fusions, of course, in lung cancer is a good example, relatively rare. Uh, targeted sequencing assays can miss new drivers. Um, one of the early goals of these efforts, of course, uh, are to enrich uh, our phase one and two clinical trials rather than uh, basically ascribing patients in a random uh, fashion to these st studies. We want to basically have a better chance that these clinical trials uh, will have a, a better chance of success by enriching these trials uh, based on uh, molecular information. We also have the ability to characterize mechanisms of res resistance uh, because we basically can profile patients uh, before they get onto a targeted therapy or clinical trial, uh, as well as once they progress on that particular clinical trial, uh, suggesting that we can compare uh, the mutational landscape and basically understand uh, potential mechanisms of resistance. And then certainly, um, by a more comprehensive approach rather than a targeted approach, this, uh, this certainly uh, affords an opportunity for new discoveries to be made. So this has been our, the workflow of our clinical sequencing effort. Uh, we were likely one of the first um, uh, laboratories that established a, uh, a clinical s sequencing effort for advanced cancer patients. Um, and essentially, we're enrolling patients that have failed conventional treatments, uh, generally metastatic disease, and are looking for uh, potential options in terms of uh, off-label use of approved agents or potentially uh, clinical, clinical trials. Um, uh, and the general approach is, is that, again, these are real-time biopsies of metastases, not archival samples that we're using in, in most cases. Uh, and the basic idea is that we take a sample uh, of the tumor tissue and compare that to a matched sample of uh, the germline, a buccal swab, or a, a blood sample. So we're basically comparing the tumor uh, genome to a matched normal genome. We carry out integrative sequencing, computational analysis, and then this data is presented to our Precision Medicine Tumor Board, which then basically deliberates upon the actionability uh, of these findings. And then we have permission to return these results back to individual patients. Um, so I, I don't really have to go over this cartoon with you in, in detail, but this is certainly one of the tenets of precision medicine or precision oncology. The idea that you can begin to um, uh, match uh, potential mutations with potential targeted therapies. For example, a patient that might have a PIK3CA mutation, you might suggest a PIK3 kinase inhibitor. 
a patient that has an FGFR1 kinase amplification, an FGFR inhibitor, and so forth. This is certainly one of the basic tenets of these precision medicine, precision oncology approaches. Um, so in, when we initiated uh, our effort in 2010, 2011, uh, what we really wanted to do was be comprehensive about the types of mutations or aberrations that are known to cause cancer. We wanted to capture structural rearrangements in terms of translocations and gene fusions, copy number alterations, amplifications, deletions, loss of heterozygosity, point mutations and indels, as well as gene expression alterations in terms of various pathways, uh, outlier genes that might be dis dysregulated. So to get to that uh, uh, goal, uh, what, we've, what we established early on was this idea of integrative sequencing. It's really a combination of technologies that really allows you to be comprehensive about the classes of mutations that can cause cancer. Uh, this includes low-pass whole genome sequencing, uh, whole exome sequencing uh, of the tumor matched with normal. Generally, we're doing about 150 to 200x coverage. Uh, and uh, transcriptome sequencing, or RNA uh, sequencing. So it's really this combination uh, of technologies that allows you to be relatively comprehensive uh, about the mutational uh, landscape uh, of cancer. Uh, after we sequenced the first 20 patients in the study, and now we've probably sequenced over 1,000 patients, but in the first 20 patients, what we found was that we were actually getting most of the information from the exome data, uh, as well as the transcriptome data, and thus reserved whole genome sequencing only for a select set of patients in which we were not identifying potential drivers. And this, of course, also uh, mit helped us mitigate the costs of doing these analysis uh, analyses on individual patients. One of the first um, things that we faced uh, as we established this uh, protocol in 2010 was whether we could return the results in a clinically relevant time frame. Certainly a number of advances have occurred since then, but um, what we were able to show early on was that we could certainly carry out these studies and return the results within a four to six week turnaround period from the time of biopsy uh, to pathology assessment, sample prep, sequencing analysis, and return uh, of results. Now with the latest developments in terms of sequencing technology as well as um, improvements in computational analysis, this turnaround time can certainly be improved to about one to two weeks. Uh, one of the innovations that we introduced in our clinical sequencing effort was the idea of using multidisciplinary precision medicine tumor boards. Um, again, this is basically the adaptation of the conventional tumor board me methodology, but now really including experts in the area of genomics and informatics, clinical genetics, bioethics, and so forth, to collaborate with and work with very intimately with medical oncologists, pathologists, and radiologists who are typically uh, attending these uh, tumor boards. What our precision medicine tumor boards, or PMTB boards, uh, facilitate or focus on, and we've now, uh, we've now had about 60 uh, precision medicine tumor board meetings, what they really focus on are the actionability uh, of the findings that we, uh, that we identify. And they generally classify the actionability based on a class one aberration, which suggests that an already approved agent uh, could be utilized in an individual patient. A class two type of mutation suggests that an investigational agent might be appropriate. Uh, so this would be a clinical trial, either a late stage clinical trial or an earlier stage toxicity study. Class three type mutations are generally there's preclinical evidence that a potential mutation uh, might be a driver and there might actually be some probe compounds in development, but nothing has been actually tested in, in humans. And then finally, a class four aberration is of unknown significance. So this. Precision, this multidisciplinary precision medicine tumor board really deliberates on the, the actionability of the individual findings that we uh, discover in an individual patient. And certainly after uh, our precision medicine tumor board meets, we issue a molecular report to the physician uh, as well as the individual patient. Uh, I alluded to this earlier, um, certainly this um, uh, effort uh, of comprehensive sequencing uh, of individual patients has been fruitful in terms of individual discoveries. Um, and these are actually individual patients that were enrolled in our myonkasy clinical sequencing effort that actually led to new discoveries. Uh, for example, we discovered the NAB2 STAT6 fusion uh, as a driver fusion for solitary uh, fibrous tumors. Uh, and 100% of these tumors are actually characterized by this particular uh, gene fusion. We've had some remarkable responses in individual patients. Uh, I'll share a few of them in, in, in subsequent slides. 
Uh, but for example, a pediatric patient that we treated on this study or that we uh, sequenced on this study, uh, 11 year old girl, uh, had an ETV6 able fusion uh, that we detected in a pediatric uh, leukemia. Uh, and we were able to put this patient on imatinib and put this patient into a significant uh, rem remission. And we've had uh, numerous anecdotes uh, like that. We've also uh, discovered rare but targetable FGFR kinase fusions across an array of diverse tumor types, across epithelial tumor, tumor types, enriched in col cholangiocarcinoma, uh, as well as found in breast cancer, prostate cancer, and other cancers. We've discovered uh, common resistance mechanisms, for example, uh, estrogen receptor 1 mutations as a common resistance mechanism in, in ER positive metastatic breast cancer. Generally, patients we believe that have been treated with aromatase inhibitors appear to have this particular uh, resistance mechanism, suggesting that ER signaling still is in play in the context of patients that have become resistant to tamoxifen as well as aromatase inhibitor therapy. Uh, so since our efforts uh, began, uh, in 2010, 2011, uh, we've now sequenced uh, over 1,000 uh, patients. And one of our uh, goals over the next um, uh, year or so is to really be able to sequence every patient uh, that comes to our comprehensive cancer center. But to date, we've sequenced about 1,000 patients in terms of whole exome sequencing combined with RNA sequencing, uh, over 600 patients, uh, adult patients, uh, about 150 patients in the pediatric oncology space, and over 200 patients in terms of a Stand Up to Cancer uh, Prostate Cancer Foundation Dream Team effort, which I'll share with you uh, at the end. Uh, so in terms of the pediatric uh, space, uh, the workflow is quite similar. Uh, but the issues around pediatric oncology are often quite different in terms of consent issues uh, dealing with minors, uh, as well as potential implications to the family when germline uh, events are, are identified, as well as the lack uh, of uh, uh, potential um, uh, candidate uh, therapies for uh, the pediatric population, uh, as well as understanding the correct dosages uh, for uh, the pediatric population. So these are multiple challenges that we had to face before getting approval for this independent uh, protocol. But what was intriguing about this set of patients that we sequenced uh, over 100 patients was that we were able to work with a single uh, pediatric uh, oncologist, and he was able to really uh, pursue the actionability of, of each of these findings. In terms of our adult uh, protocol, we're generally working with a matrix or syndicate of medical oncologists, and they have variable, they're, they're variably interested in pursuing uh, the actionability uh, of our uh, recommendations. But in this case, we were able to, in a more regimented fashion, follow each of our patients. So in this uh, prototype study of about 100 patients, uh, 100 pediatric oncology patients that we sequenced, we looked at hematologic malignancies uh, as well as solid tumors that are represented here, a, a nice mixture uh, of cancer types. What we found, and this is just a summary, in terms of uh, uh, driver mutations, we generally found in about 50% of cases a somatic SNV or indel, uh, a gene fusion in about 30% of cases as a driver, homozygous deletions, amplifications. And in over 10% of cases, we actually found a pathogenic germline variation that, was, that we needed to actually report back to the family in terms of implications for that individual patient as well uh, as their family, suggesting that certainly in a pediatric oncology patient that they should, uh, uh, that genetic counseling should be considered uh, in this context. In red, you can see that only a subset of these driver mutations were potentially actionable uh, in nature. So now summarizing uh, the actionability uh, in terms of this first 100 patients that we sequenced, uh, we found that only about 46% of cases in the pediatric population, we were actually able to identify something that was clinically actionable. Uh, when that was, uh, and in, in that case, um, we were only actually able to act upon uh, about 53% of those uh, cases, uh, primarily because of issues in terms of uh, we got the information too late. Uh, the uh, patient uh, was not uh, eligible for that particular clinical trial, or they weren't able to uh, travel to that site. So a variety of challenges that come, come across, even when you actually identify a clinically actionable event. But in those patients that we were actually able to act upon, uh, we were able to change therapy in 60% of the patients and provide genetic counseling in about 40% uh, uh, of patients. Uh, and and in, this, in this case, 
about 80% of the patients that we were able to act upon uh, actually had a clinical benefit in terms of basically uh, a durable response in terms of therapy uh, as well as potential uh, benefit to the, to the family. Uh, about 20% of cases, uh, the limited number that we were actually able to act upon, uh, we did not, the, the patients did not uh, exhibit a clinical benefit. Again, this is just an early study that suggests the promise uh, of these precision medicine uh, efforts. So this is the team that was really involved uh, with this study, uh, uh, a number of individuals in my group, uh, as well as our close collaboration with Rajan Modi, uh, who's the head of our phase one pediatric oncology uh, group at the University of Michigan. The last story that I'd like to share with you is really one of our efforts to begin to take these um, clinical sequencing efforts to a multi-institutional scale, working with multiple different uh, cancer centers uh, in the context of uh, cast metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. So this study uh, was funded by the Stand Up to Cancer organization as well as the Prostate Cancer Foundation. And one of the surprising aspects of this study is, is that we found at least in metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, in over 90% of cases, we were actually able to identify something actionable. So this is the, uh, the team that I co-lead uh, with Charles Sawyers at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, we've been all involved a number of key investigators uh, across the country, as well as Johan de Bono uh, at uh, the ICR uh, Royal Marsden, who's been a key collaborator. Uh, so in this uh, particular study, we're basically doing real-time biopsies of patients with metastatic prostate cancer, oftentimes bone biopsies or soft tissue biopsies. Um, and we're enrolling at eight different clinical sites. So it's actually one of the first multi-institutional uh, clinical sequencing efforts. Uh, we're actually funded to sequence 500 patients with castration-resistant disease. What I'll be sharing with you today is, is an interim analysis uh, of about 150 patients uh, that we've sequenced thus far. We've actually sequenced about 250 now to date, and we're rapidly approaching the, the 500 uh, number. But we're enrolling uh, at eight different clinical sites. Uh, the sequencing and analysis actually occurs at the University of Michigan and at the Broad Institute. Uh, the data is integrated at Memorial Sloan Kettering and then visualized through the CBIO portal. Uh, we have precision medicine tumor boards at each of our respective institutions, uh, and the, the central pathology review is carried out at Weill Cornell. So this is really a team uh, effort in terms of involvement uh, across multiple in institutions, uh, multiple uh, principles in the development of this study. Uh, so we have about eight different clinical trials that are uh, associated with patients that are enrolled on this clinical sequencing effort. Um, patients in the pre-abiraterone, pre-enzalutamide space, as well as patients, uh, metastatic pr prostate cancer patients in the post-abiraterone enzalutamide space. So this is a listing of the clinical trials that the patients were potentially eligible for. Again, all metastatic castration-resistant <coughs> prostate cancer. Uh, and the various clinical trials that were associated with this study were really focused around targeting androgen receptor or DNA repair pathways. Um, this is basically a summary uh, of the types of uh, biopsies that we were able to obtain uh, from these patients. Uh, this varied from lymph node, bone, liver, and soft tissue. Uh, when we began the study, I think one of the challenges that we needed to approach was whether we would be able to adequately sample bone, uh, because bone is a favorite site for prostate cancer metastases. And what we found was that we were, in probably over 80% of cases, able to adequately sample bone in terms of these precision medicine uh, efforts. So this basically gives you an overview of the landscape of uh, genomic alterations that we saw in the first 150 patients that we sequenced in a multi-institutional fashion. Um, so individual patients are uh, listed as uh, uh, columns, uh, while individual genes are, different, uh, are represented as different rows. And we've grouped them into the various clinically actionable pathways that we defined. So this include, uh, includes AR-associated aberrations, uh, PI3 kinase pathway aberrations, RAF, WENT pathway, DNA repair, cell cycle, chromatin modifiers, and others. We also identified that a subset of these patients, uh, about um, four out of 150, had a hypermutated phenotype uh, that was actually attributed to aberrations in mismatch repair. Uh, this is pro potentially intriguing because these, this set of hypermutated pa patients could potentially uh, benefit from immunotherapy-based uh, approaches with the idea that the hypermutated phenotype 
could potentially create neoantigens, making them more susceptible uh, to an immunotherapy-based uh, approach. Uh, so through this analysis of 150 patients, we certainly picked up the common uh, mutations or aberrations that were known in castration-resistant uh, prostate cancer, including aberrations in the androgen receptor pathway, P53, P10, uh, as well as the ETS fusion in a high prevalence uh, of patients. The rest of the mutations generally ran ranged from about 2 to 10 percent in prevalence. So this gives you the copy number landscape of this, uh, of this cohort of patients. Um, we certainly picked up known uh, aberrations that were known in castration-resistant disease, for example, the AR amplification, as well as the TMPRSS2 ERG deletion, which re results in the fusion. But we, f we picked up some novel uh, associations, including PIK3CA and PIK3CB uh, amplifications, uh, as well as um, homozygous loss of ZBTB16, which is a negative regulator of androgen receptor signaling. In terms of the ETS fusions uh, that we described in 2005, we certainly identified a, that over 60 percent of cases uh, harbored a driver uh, gene fusion. A majority of them were ETS-based gene fusions. We also identified RAF fusions, uh, our spondin fusions that were previously uh, characterized in colon cancer, uh, as well as, intriguingly, uh, PI3 kinase uh, uh, fusions. These were all mutually exclusive driver fusions in these cases. So when we compare metastatic castration-resistant disease with primary hormone-naive disease, uh, we see that certain mutations uh, appear to evolve, likely due to treatment pressures. This includes um, mutation of P53, which is enriched in metastatic castration-resistant disease, AR amplification, of course, as well as a number of other genes that appear to be enriched in uh, metastatic progression uh, of prostate cancer. So now let's just drill down into the individual pathways that we explored using this technology. Uh, the androgen receptor pathway, of course, was expected to be aberrant in prostate cancer, and certainly in a large percentage of cases, probably on the order of 50 percent of cases, we actually saw AR amplification. But in addition to AR amplification, we picked up activating mutations of AR, um, which are shown uh, here. These are activating, no, in some cases, known, in some cases, new um, mutations that were identified that are potentially activating in terms of AR uh, activity. Uh, we also found aberrations that in uh, key components of the androgen receptor pathway, for example, a loss of function of NCOR1 and 2, which is a negative regulator of AR, um, aberrations in FOXA1, which is a pioneer transcription factor, as well as homozygous deletion of ZBTB16, which is an AR-regulated gene that negatively regulates uh, AR. Uh, these are all aberrations that appear to, to converge upon or get activated in terms of castration-resistant uh, disease. Um, in terms of the PI3 kinase pathway, uh, we found that in about 50 percent of cases, we found an aberration in this pathway. Uh, we picked up, uh, of course, the homozygous loss of P10, which was known, but we also picked up some novel aberrations in a number of other key components of the pathway, which are represented here. We picked up the activating mutations of PIK3CA, which were known to be rare relatively in prostate cancer. But through this study, we actually discovered activating mutations of PIK3CB. And so these activating mutations of PIK3CB are, are, are known to be, are, are shown to be functionally analogous uh, to the activating mutations of PIK3, uh, PIK3CA, and they're occurring in key amino acids that are uh, analogous to those that are known to be activating in PIK3CA. And so this particular finding is exciting uh, because there are certain uh, drug companies that are actually developing uh, small molecule inhibitors that target PIK3CB specifically relative to PIK3CA. And uh, in addition to both the um, activating mutations of PIK3CA and PIK3CB. We saw uh, amplifications of PIK3CA and PIK3CB, which were discovered in the study, as well as recurrent gene fusions of PIK3CA and PIK3CB that lead to massive overexpression of these kinases, similar to the ETS fusions, where they basically inherit an androgen-regulated 5' prime partner that leads to overexpression of PIK3CB, shown by RNA-seq data. Um, so these are basically, this is an example of a of clinical impact on a patient that was enrolled uh, on this study that received basically 
Uh, this is a patient uh, that was enrolled by Johan de Bono at, at the Marsden uh, that had a PIK3CB uh, amplification. And you can see the location of the tumor here. This patient was treated with the GSK uh, inhibitor of PIK3CB uh, and sh showed significant regression of the tumor as well as marked decreases in PSA levels, a 70% decrease in PSA levels after receiving the PIK3CB uh, inhibitor. And this PIK3CB inhibitor was only, uh, appears to only work, uh, according to Johan, in patients that have an aberration of PIK3CB. And then finally, the last um, major finding in this study that probably had, has, the, has the most clinical impact uh, was that in about 20 to 30 percent of patients, we actually identified uh, aberrations in the DNA repair pathway. Uh, this included uh, aberrations in BRCA2, ATM, and BRCA1 in prostate cancer, uh, again approaching 20 to 30 percent of patients. Uh, BRCA2 was the most enriched in metastatic disease, both somatic aberrations shown here, uh, as well as germline uh, aberrations of BRCA2. And, and these findings are certainly exciting because it really suggests uh, that these patients could benefit from PARP inhibitors. Um, um, the PARP inhibitor Olaparib, for example, has been approved in ovarian cancer patients with BRCA aberration. Uh, this would suggest that pa prostate cancer patients that have an aberration in DNA repair might benefit uh, from uh, PARP uh, inhibitors. The other intriguing aspect was that a high prevalence of these patients actually have a germline uh, aberration in BRCA2. And here are some of the clinical responses of patients, again, that have been enrolled on our Stand Up to Cancer study. This is, again, another patient from uh, Johan de Bono's study. Uh, this patient had a homozygous deletion of BRCA2 and was treated with the PARP inhibitor Olaparib. So this is an imaging study um, before treatment, a widespread uh, metastases shown here. And then after Olaparib treatment, significant regression uh, of, the, uh, of the tumors based on this imaging study. And there was a significant decrease of PSA from about 30 to zero in this particular patient. Uh, and this patient, as well as a series of additional patients, have maintained a durable response uh, to uh, Olaparib treatment, uh, again, according to, to Johan. So this is a patient, another Stand Up to Cancer, uh, Prostate Cancer Foundation patient that was enrolled by uh, Maha Hussein at the University of Michigan. This patient also had a homozygous deletion of BRCA2. Uh, you can see the metastasis to the liver. Um, this patient was then treated on abiraterone plus a PARP inhibitor called, uh, it's the Abbott PARP inhibitor. And you can see the significant regression uh, of this liver metastases uh, post uh, PARP inhibitor abiraterone treatment and a marked decrease in PSA from 127 to less than 0.1. Um, and we've had a number of these exceptional responders, all of which have had defects in DNA repair and have had significant responses to uh, PARP inhibitors, both uh, in this particular uh, study uh, led by Maha Hussein, as well as multiple uh, potential examples uh, in the two PARP study uh, led by Johan de Bono. So in terms of driver mutations in castration-resistant disease, uh, um, we find that when we look at somatic mutations, SNVs and indels, in about 100% of cases, we can actually nominate a driver mutation that's at a high allele count and a, a dominant clone. Uh, in about 50 to 60% of cases, we can identify a, a driver gene fusion, uh, homozygous deletions at about 50%, uh, a focal amplification at about 50%, and interestingly, a pathogenic germline variation uh, in about 10%, over 10% of cases, uh, suggesting that, again, patients with um, metastatic prostate cancer should potentially consider genetic counseling uh, because of the high prevalence of pathogenic uh, germline events in this population. And now when we focus in on the actionability of these findings, uh, what's remarkable is that in over 90% of cases, we're actually able to identify an actionable event in me metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. This is actually broken up into um, AR itself, which is present in about 60% of cases, but when you don't include aberrations in, in AR, which of course were known previously, uh, in over 60% of cases, we can actually identify something clinically actionable uh, in the context of being not related to the AR pathway. This includes uh, actionable events in the PI3 kinase pathway, DNA repair, RAF pathway, CDK inhibition, so this would be cell cycle, the WENT pathway, 
as well as pathogenic germline aberrations. And so this is a, an example of uh, some of the clinically actionable uh, mutations that we identified. Uh, for example, DNA repair aberrations shown here could potentially match with PARP inhibitors. Uh, PIK3CB being matched to PIK3CB inhibitors. Again, these are just examples from this cohort. Uh, another interesting observation uh, were RNF43 loss, ZNRF3 loss, as well as our spawn infusions, which could potentially be matched with porcupine inhibitors or hedgehog inhibitors as well as antibodies directed against arspondin. Um, and then finally, um, the deleterious germline variants would certainly suggest potential genetic counseling for that subset of patients. So what are the highlights of this particular study around castration-resistant disease? What do we find from this study? This is one of the first uh, multi-institutional integrative clinical sequencing efforts, um, and it suggests that it's certainly feasible in metastatic prostate, prostate cancer, metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, uh, in about 90% of cases, we were actually able to uh, identify a clinically actionable molecular alteration. In this particular study, we actually identified some novel genomic aberrations, uh, some of which are listed here. Uh, in over 20% of cases, probably 20 to 30% of cases, we were actually able to show that uh, these patients harbor uh, DNA repair pathway aberrations and, might, and suggest that these patients might be amenable to PARP inhibitor or platinum-based therapies. And then finally, in 8 to 10 percent of patients, we identified uh, harbor pathogenic germline findings, suggesting that genetic counseling or genetic screening uh, of these patients might be considered similar to what's already being done in the context of BRCA uh, screening in breast cancer. One should begin to consider this in the context of advanced prostate cancer. So some final take-home points that I think are uh, just relevant to precision medicine and precision oncology in general. Um, I think it may be uh, possible to provide a relatively comprehensive mutational landscape for an individual cancer patient in terms of exome and transcriptomic analyses. I think it's possible. The costs are going to decrease as well as the turnaround time will, will improve. I think it's important to monitor a variety of mutation classes and being sure to monitor point mutations, indels, copy number alterations, fusions, and, and others. One of the early goals of these studies will basically be to enrich uh, patient populations in terms of clinical trials as well as off-label use of approved drugs. Uh, I think the long-term goal is really to move towards combination treatments that are based on the mutational assessment of an individual patient, matching the combination of muta driver mutations that are identified in an individual patient with a combination uh, of, of, of treatments. And then the final point, and I, and I think we'll have a um, panel discussion on this in a little bit more detail, uh, these types of efforts uh, certainly are multidisciplinary in nature uh, and really represent a team effort of a number of individuals across disciplines, including pathologists, genetic counselors, oncologists, radiologists, and bioinformaticians, clinical geneticists, and bioethicists to essentially make this type of program work in, in a regimented fashion. With that, uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention and certainly highlight uh, the various individuals that are part of our Stand Up to Cancer Prostate Cancer Foundation Dream Team. Uh, a number, about eight different institutions, and two key individuals who really pioneered our initial study, Dan Robinson at the University of Michigan, and Ellie Van Ellen uh, at the Broad Institute, and certainly the contributions of the various uh, teams, over 150 individual participants on this particular project. Um, thank you for your attention, and if we have time, I'd, I'd be happy to take any questions. So thanks, Arul, for that spectacular demonstration of a team science <laughs> in all, all its glory. <laughs> so the floor is open for questions. So you start in the beginning. Uh, very exciting talk, thanks. Uh, I have two questions. One is that uh, I saw that you have a, a group pipeline for uh, pediatric patients and uh, a pipeline for adult pa patients. I was wondering whether you guys see the uh, uh, evidence of showing that whether pediatric patients are significantly di different in terms of their genetic background so that they need a totally different treatment. Yeah, yeah that, that's a great question. I think the question was basically what is the, the mutational difference in the pediatric population uh, relative to the adult patients, at least that we were enrolling in, in our studies. Uh, and certainly this was known before our study through TCGA efforts and so forth, and we were more or less reconfirming this in terms of the, uh, the dimensionality 
of the types of mutations in the pediatric population oftentimes are considerably less than what we're seeing, what we're seeing in uh, adult populations in terms of the number of driver mutations that were uh, identified. So I can, I can suggest that in terms of the, uh, the number as well as diversity of driver mutations tend to be less in the pediatric population relative to adult. And in terms of actionability, we find that the impact, uh, we believe, at least comparing our pediatric patients to our adult patients, we've had more uh, clinical responses in our pediatric patients relative to our uh, adult patients with the idea that they have potentially less drivers to impact when you look at looking at a more evolved adult patient where they have multiple drivers that might be in play, it becomes much more difficult uh, to, to treat those patients. Thanks. The second question is that, uh, uh, do you think the uh, epigenetic profiling will provide more information in, the, in addition to the sequencing, for example, the, the methylation status and, uh, and uh, other status of that? Yeah. yeah, I think certainly we're beginning to explore the idea of using DNA methylation analysis uh, as well as histone methylation analysis in a subset uh, of patients. Uh, we haven't really found a clinically actionable uh, observation using those technologies yet, uh, but I, I do think that uh, moving into the future that they will have potential, but we're certainly exploring that in a research uh, setting. Thank you. Charlie? Thanks, Errol. Um, in, in terms of the patients with DNA repair abnormalities, um, do you see um, it always hemizygous events or are they affecting both alleles when you see responses to, let's say, um, PARP inhibitors? Do you actually stratify patients based on biallelic events or is, say, a yeah. hemizygous event in ATM sufficient to put a patient on a, on a PARP inhibitor? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great question. I think in a vast majority of the patients that we were seeing the responses, uh, we were seeing a homozygous event. Yeah. So, for example, with BRCA2, uh, there are many cases where we see a germline event as well as a somatic uh, yeah. event, and that was the case in ATM as well as BRCA1. So have you seen responses in patients without a germline event? So, so if, you, if you just take, take out those patients with germline, say, BRCA2 mutations? Uh, yes. You do? So yes. there are patients who have biallelic uh, exactly. abnormalities right. in ATM or BRCA2? Correct. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hi, thanks for the great talk. So given large genomic alterations you found in this study, I wonder whether you could comment on um, efforts that we could take into understand the cooperating mutation events. And, and similarly, whether you can um, talk about the efforts that we should understand alterations that involve DNA um, mutations versus changes at the transcriptional level such as the overexpression of EZH2 has been frequently reported in prostate cancer. Uh, can you just summarize that question again? I, I Sorry, uh, I guess the question is, uh, could you comment on the efforts that um, we could undertake to understand the cooperating mutation events in many of these alterations, as well as um, cooperating between DNA mutations versus changes in transcriptome? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, uh, so I guess the question was um, the, maybe the integrative aspect of our approach of using whole exome sequencing of DNA with RNA sequencing transcriptome, transcriptomic uh, analyses. Uh, oftentimes the things that we were uh, nominating using transcriptomic data were DNA-based events, but just not easily appreciated using whole exome-based technologies, uh, such as, for example, gene fusions. We were often using um, uh, trend, uh, RNA-seq-based approaches for that, and we find that that's critically important for the pediatric population, where oftentimes the driver aberration is indeed a, a gene fusion, which is often, of course, going to be missed by standard uh, exome technology. So we do think that it's important uh, to use uh, the uh, transcriptomic data to complement uh, the efforts in terms of whole exome assessment in order to pick up gene fusions, certainly. Uh, also. Uh, in terms of uh, potential outlier genes and various pathways that are uh, aberrant uh, using uh, transcriptomic data, you can uh, basically complement the analysis uh, in that context. Uh, as well as, I think, um, moving forward, uh, looking at uh, various gene sets that might suggest pathway activation that can be taken advantage of using RNA-seq data. But, of course, it becomes much more complicated uh, using RNA-seq data for that because you have to oftentimes subtract out the admixture of normal 
stromal events that might be strom stromal components relative to the tumor component. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Joel? I just uh, rule. Great progress. Um, as, as we've tried to go down this road, um, you made the point that uh, in the recurrent disease, you were picking up something like 40% uh, new actionable mutations uh, in the uh, uh, parallel or in the uh, subsequent sequencing. And as we've, tr okay, so now you've got the actionable mutations. The question I'm getting to is, can you get a drug that actually att attacks the actionable mutations? And can you get it sufficiently quickly to be clinically usable. I mean, that's, that's yeah. been our major problem and stumbling block yeah. in uh, dealing with precision medicine is we can't For get sure. the drugs. Yeah, that, that's been uh, the, the major challenge. And, and there was certainly evidence in the context of the pediatric study uh, where uh, in only about 50% of cases that we actually identified something actionable that we were actually able to get the, get the drug uh, in terms of uh, either uh, getting the approved agent and using it potentially off-label, uh, or uh, being able to enroll that patient onto that clinical trial. And it was particularly a challenge with the pediatric population, primarily because they're oftentimes excluded uh, on many of these adult, uh, adult studies. Um, in terms of our adult population, uh, I think we've certainly had major challenges, at least certainly in the U.S., in terms of actually uh, obtaining an already approved agent, an FDA approved agent for another indication and to use that off label even though we have genetic evidence to suggest that that patient might respond, we've had massive challenges in terms of being able to convince the insurance companies involved to potentially pay for those oftentimes very expensive uh, targeted therapies. That's been an ongoing uh, challenge that's often been sort of a hit and miss process in terms of how lucky we are in, in terms of uh, convincing uh, individual uh, insurance companies to potentially pay for those efforts. We have since developed a parallel philanthropic fund to basically try to cover uh, patients in which their insurance doesn't uh, compensate them for that targeted therapy. So we often use that fund to try to support uh, those, those efforts. So I, I think this is an ongoing uh, challenge uh, moving forward is um, really beginning to um, uh, convince insurance companies to begin to cover uh, these sequencing-based approaches in the first place, but then also begin to consider um, uh, paying for uh, these expensive um, targeted therapies, or at least in the context of early signal-finding studies. Yes, I think we'll just take uh, two more questions, and then we'll move on. So I think Mao, and then over you. Yeah, so for your, uh, my uncle's study, um, instead of just looking at those individual responders, have you collected enough sufficient uh, outcome data to demonstrate it is indeed better than the convention way to treat patients? Yeah, yeah so with the MyOncoSeq study, um, in the adult, and I think I alluded to this earlier, in the adult study, that has been more of a challenge. Uh, so uh, in the pediatric study, we were able to actually collect outcome in information and actually follow each of the patients in terms of the actionability of the individual findings because we were dealing with a single uh, oncologist. Uh, the adult study uh, often involved over 50 different oncologists. Um, while uh, we, we've certainly been able to analyze the data in terms of uh, whether uh, the physicians have um, followed our recommendations, we haven't necessarily been able to really uh, enforce, I would say, sort of uh, uh, the individual physician to pursue that uh, thought if it's an off-label use of an approved agent uh, or um, a, uh, enrollment on a particular uh, uh, um, um, in investigational uh, study. So it's been a lot more difficult in the adult setting than in the pediatric, uh, pediatric se setting for a number of reasons. In the, in the pediatric se se setting, we're working with a very motivated uh, pediatric oncologist who's willing to sort of uh, follow up the patient uh, and uh, pursue um, uh, the investigational agent or uh, somehow obtaining the um, app approved agent. While well, in the adult setting, it's oftentimes a, sort of a syndicate of oncologists that we, we've had to work with. Yeah, so perhaps you should do it as like a clinical trial setting. You may yes. even have a you know, controlled arm to demonstrate the clinical utility. Exactly. I think that that's I think the next phase of a lot of the studies that people are uh, beginning to consider is really doing this in a much more regimented fashion. Last question. 
Hi, great talk. Uh, um, your discovery of the lineage-specific and cancer-type-specific expression of link RNA is very interesting. So I have a technical question. Um, how sensitive is the result to the sample preparation? So is there um, pr any problem of the degradation? Can you, do, can you repeat the same result on the FFP samples or any like heavy stain cells or cell lines? Right. Um, yeah, so it, it's certainly very sensitive to degradation and in order to do the RNA-seq uh, analysis, um, uh, we're using the, so this, so this analysis is really focused around polyadenylated RNAs um, and it's very much uh, sensitive to degradation and, and it generally doesn't work in the context of FFPE samples. Uh, but we have developed a parallel approach that works quite well in FFPE using capture-based technology, a capture-based RNA-seq that then you can essentially monitor these RNA, uh, these uh, long non-coding RNAs in degraded samples. But uh, the data that I presented here uh, was really using fresh samples with high-quality uh, RNA. All right, so I think all of you, this is a fantastic talk, so please give me, a, help me to thank Dr. Chan. Thank you, thank you.